good to see you. It's nice weather we're having out here. <laughs> World's literally burning down all around us. Great. It's real mesmore for something. I don't know. So, let's try not to think about that and let's learn some C++. Um, we're going to continue recursion today all week. This is recursion week. Uh, do you want to hear a really bad recursion joke? Yes. Yes. Okay, here it goes. Knock, knock. Infinite recursion. Knock, knock. Yeah, yeah. This is as good as I got. Sorry. <laughs> I will say, uh, in I, I wrote a book, a Java textbook. It's not used here at Stanford. Um, it was where I worked at University of Washington in the past. And in our book, you know, we taught about recursion, and in the index at the end of the book, we put an entry that said recursion, comma, infinite. C, recursion, comma, infinite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's why the book isn't used here. <laughs> yes, slow clap, thank you. That's the appropriate response. We, we had to, like, fight to get the joke in. The, uh, the indexer, like they have a person who does the index, and she just like couldn't understand why we wanted to put this in. And we're like, it's a joke, it's funny. And she was like, but it doesn't go to a page number. <laughs> we're like, we know, we know, that's the joke. And she's like, but then it says C and it goes to itself. And I'm like, that's the joke, yeah, it's really funny. It's really funny. And she, you know, she's a publisher, she wasn't a computer scientist. Finally, she's like, okay, whatever, she, she put it. Um, yeah, okay, so we're gonna do more recursion. Look, I mean, mostly today I just want to practice more. And in fact, this week's section will be like that too. You'll just practice a lot of recursion problems. So the meat of the lecture is just going to be us looking at some different problems and seeing if we can solve them. And uh, because I think that's how you learn recursion is you have to practice. So of course, like I said last time, I encourage all of you to go practice uh, in Qt Creator or in Code Step by Step or just whatever way that you can get good at this. Actually go write recursion code. That's how you get better. That's how you get it. Uh, if you don't already feel like you get it. So um, quickly, just to recap, um, what is a recursive function? It's one that calls itself, right? OK, so um, if you're trying to solve a recursive problem, you're trying to write a recursive function, what are some things you might want to think about? What are some concepts that might be useful to think about? Any ideas? Any general tips? What do you say? Some sort of basic version of the problem, a base case, some sort of problem for which you know the solution or have a very, very simple way to ascertain the solution. Yes, thank you. He said base case. So, um, you know, try to think of a very simple version of the problem that would be easy to solve that you wouldn't even need to use any recursion to solve. You could just return an answer, print an answer, whatever. Try to think about that. Um, you might or might not start with that case, but I don't know why I keep having system errors today. Uh, but yes, that's an important part of every recursive function. It has to stop at some point. The base case is what makes it stop. So think about what the base case or case as might be. Yes. Is there anything else you would add to that comment? Yes. How is this problem self-similar? Yeah, thank you. Um, I really like that framing. Like if, you know, the way I like to think of it is, if I could have other people help me solve most of this problem, but I had to solve a little bit of the problem myself, how could I arrange that? And that's sort of a, the same idea, is how is this problem similar to a slightly smaller version or slightly different version of the same problem? Great, okay, so let's just play, let's practice some more. We wrote a power function, we wrote a, a factorial function, a couple of things like that. We wrote an is palindrome finder. I wanna do this one with you called print binary. So uh, accept an integer parameter in base 10, and I want you to print with like to console to see out, don't return, but print the binary base two representation of that number. You guys know binary just like uh, 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 everything zero or one, and each digit, binary digit, each bit is a power of two instead of each digit being a power of 10, you know, this sort of thing. So if you want to figure out the, um, the binary version of the number 42, well, that's a 32 plus an 8 plus a 2 makes a 42. So um, that's kind of how you do binary numbers, right? OK, so I want to I print that out. Now, I don't want to cheat or call some library function that does conversion for me. I also don't want to use any loops. I also would like to do this without converting the number into a string. I think some people like to convert integers into strings so that they can loop over the digits or something. I think if we want to loop over digits, I want to do them without strings being involved. Um, so, how do you do this? Well, you guys just gave me some really good advice. I think I want to return to that advice. You told me that I should think about base cases, right? 
So I don't know if I can think of a general way to turn this into that, but are there any <coughs> numbers that are kind of easy to print in binary? What do you say? Shaggy, yes. Well, less than one. Less than equal to one. Okay, a uh, single digit binary number, zero or one, that seems pretty easy, right? Okay, well, let's go try. I've got Qt Creator here. I've also, this is in step by step if you want as well. Um, so I'm gonna uncomment this. These are my test cases. And the test cases call print binary here. So, okay, wait. Uh, oh, wait, no, 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 that's not right. Um, here, here it is. Okay, so we can assume for a minute that this is a non negative number that we're printing out. So you told me that if it's a small number, so if n is less than or equal to 1, then I can just do C out n because it's the same in base 10. Great. <laughs> That's the hard part. Okay. Uh, hmm. Base case. I, you know, recursion can be really tricky, but it's kind of fun too because it just fe almost feels like you're cheating. It's like I only have to do the easy part. I have to like <laughs> print 1 or 0 or something. That's not very hard to do. Well, okay, but what if, what if it isn't that base case? So this is going to be the re recursive case, which means that n is at least 2. Hmm. That's harder. You gave me another good tip. You said uh, try to see how the problem is self-similar. So, okay, I like that tip. I think that might be a helpful tip. So if I'm going to try to print 42, I don't know what that turns into. I mean, I know because I looked at the slide, but I don't generally know. Um, is there a way that my call could do part of that? Um, do I know anything about what the binary version of 42 is or isn't? Do I, I mean, even if I don't know how many digits it has exactly or what those numbers are going to be, can I tell anything about it just from looking at the number 42? Yes? It's an even number, so the binary representation ends with a zero. That's a good idea. Hmm, okay. Well. What if I told you that print binary of 42, that's going to be 101010. So you just, you just told me that you could figure out that part, right? But that's the hard part. What is this? Yes? Essentially, it's all the powers of 2 represented. It's the powers of 2, right. And so what, what is this number? This binary number is what? This is the binary of 21. So I don't know how to print the binary of 42, but if someone else could please print the binary of 21 for me, if some magical smarter person than me could do that, then I could do this part. I got this part right here. <laughs> it's like, you know, you ever like help your mom or dad clean up, you know, and they do all the work and you like pick up a couple of things and throw them in the trash and you're like, there, we both helped out today. <laughs> like, that's my contribution. I'll print this zero here. Okay, so let's go to what you said. You said it ends with a zero, or ends with a two. It's an even number, so I can print a zero. So um, maybe what I could do is something like int last digit equals, uh, the last digit is, um, you know, you probably were looking at that two, like which would be like n mod 10, but that's not quite right. I think what we really want is the last binary digit of 42, right? So the remainder, is, is this even or odd? That's a remainder by two. Um, then the, other digits of the binary number are going to be n divided by 2, right? Not divided by 10, because that would just be the 4. So this is going to be 0, and this is going to be 21, right? So what if I just say print the binary of the other digits, the 21 part, and then after that gets done, if, if the recursive call does what I want it to do, which is if it prints this, then I could just do C out of the last digit, right? If the last digit is a zero, I'll print a zero. If the last digit is a one, I'll print a one. Hey, <laughs> well, <laughs> negative 500 didn't work. Um, the rest of those numbers work. We basically did it. We solved it. Um, so we're, we're awesome. Yes, I'm very proud of us. Uh, so uh, we didn't handle negative numbers yet. Uh, how could I patch that in here? Are we assuming that negative numbers have a binary representation? Yeah, I guess, I guess, sorry, I didn't specify very well what I want. So here I wrote n greater than zero. What if I throw that out? What if I do um, example binary of negative uh, 43 prints negative that there? So how about that? Um, so, I mean, basically we just have to add another base case. If n is less than zero, then uh, 
cout minus sign print binary of negative n, right? <laughs> just, just print a minus sign and then do the rest. And then here, I'll, I guess I'll say else if. So this is, this is uh, base case, one, or I guess it's recursive case, actually, recursive case uh, negative number, whatever. OK, so now I think we should handle negative numbers properly. Yes, we do. Uh, I think, I mean, I didn't double check that, but that seems right. Um, <laughs> looks good. Uh, one, one thing I want to point out, just as a subtle little thing, is um, see how you say print binary other digits and then you say see out last digit? It would also be correct to say print binary of the last digit. Um, those are equivalent because if I were to call print binary on a zero or a one, it would just go to this, which prints the digit, which is what we had before. So you might say, why did you change it? You made the code do more work. Well, the reason I changed it was just that to me, the self-similarity is that the binary of 42 is the printed binary of 21 followed by the printed binary of the last digit. So to me, this is slightly more like Zen to me because it's more self-similar. But the other way worked fine. Just wanted to point out that change. So that's print binary. Um, any, any questions about that code? Yes? Could we also use the log function in the math? Oh, log, like log base two? Because yeah, I mean, what I've seen students do here sometimes is they try to go left to right. I'm actually going right to left, right? I'm chopping off the last digit, which is easy to do using div and mod. I think the other path here is you try to like log and use pow and see how big of a power of two do you need to get all the way to the left, and you try to print the left one first. And I mean, you can do it that way, but I just think this is the beautiful recursive solution. I think, I think recognizing the self-similarity goes, you know, kind of both ways. Like, I think I'd rather handle it in the way that the language makes easy to do. I don't have to call math.log or power or whatever to, to solve this problem. A lot of digit processing problems have this attribute where it doesn't really matter whether you go left to right or right to left, and the language makes it easier to go right to left, so let's do that. Um, okay. So that's print binary. Uh, I want to do another one with you guys. I think that means I'm going to jump to my, my next slide deck. Let me double check that. I think that's true. Yes. OK. Um, so let me open up my slides for today. What I'm going to try to have time for today is to talk about different ways that data can be recursive and some cool optimizations you could do on recursive code. But again, as I say, we're just going to practice a lot of examples. So here, let's process a file. Write a recursive function called reverse lines that uh, you pass in an input stream that reads a file. <coughs> Let's just say if stream, actually, whatever. But um, you pass in an input file stream as a reference. And if these are the lines, I want to print them back out in the opposite order. And I want to do it recursively, and I want to do it without collections, because you could just read all the lines into a vector and loop over the vector or something. I want to kind of find a way to use recursion to do the reversing rather than using collections to do the reversing. So I see your hand. I'll call in a second. Um, so if I go back to my file here, I want to write a file, uh, a function called reverse lines, right? So you guys gave me that good advice at the start of this lecture. I really want to take your wise advice. You said I should think about base cases, right? What's an easy file to reverse the lines of? Yes? One, one, one line? Yeah, I agree with you. I am more lazy than you seem to be, though. There's an empty file that's even easier to reverse than a one-line file. You're still right. Those are both really easy files to reverse, right? But I just want to point out that an empty file would be even less work than the minuscule amount of work that, that you told me to do. Um, how do you take out the garbage? There is none, so therefore, I'm done. I did it, you know? <laughs> um, right, so, so empty file is easy to do. Now, I, I will say one thing that makes this a little complicated is um, there's not a command for this to ask it uh, to peek ahead to see if there's a line or not, to see if it's empty or not. Uh, all you can do is you can just try to read a line and it either succeeds or fails. So like by the time you know whether there's a line, you have already read the line if there is one. Do you understand? So you can't ask without reading. Um, well, that's okay. I mean, if you want to read a line, you say get line from input 
and you pass a string like a, you know, string line, and then you say line, right? So that's the command to read a line from the file. How do I know if it, if there is a line or if there if the file's empty or what? How do I know? Yes. Put it in an if. So if get line is returning true, then there is a line of input to read. Else, there's no lines, right? So, um, hmm. so those are the two cases. Okay. Now this problem is pretty hard. So I thought maybe I could help you guys out a little bit. Um, so what I've done, you know, I'm a very compassionate, very nice teacher. So. Um, I thought maybe this one was too tricky, so I just wanted to kind of just give you the solution to this one. So um, I wrote a function before class that's called cheat law. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure if you guys could handle this problem, honestly. Um, I graded some of your homework ones. No, 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 just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, you guys are, are smart. But, but um, I wrote this function that if you pass me an input stream, I will print the file reversed uh, for you. Because I wasn't sure if we could handle this problem. But I will say, um, I feel a little bit guilty calling this function. So maybe like we could do a little bit of the work in our function, and then we can cheat the rest of it or something. So, so maybe here I could do, you know, I already read this line, right? So I have a line here. If I have that cheating function that reverses a file, I could just use that. I could just say cheat. And I could pass the input. So that's going to print like, you know, so I read this line here, roses are red. And the cheat function is going to read these other lines and print them backwards. So it's going to print this, and then this, and then this. So like the cheat call here is going to do all of these last three things here. So then I just have my line that needs to be printed, right? So, so now what? So just here I say, see out line end all, right? Cool. Um, what if there aren't any lines? Well, I guess you don't have to do anything if there aren't any lines, right? So maybe it's just an empty else. Uh, this is kind of interesting because usually we have a base case and a recursive case, and the base case is written first. So I guess if that's how you want to think of it, you could say, like, if I fail at getting a line, that's the base case, no lines. And if there's no lines, we don't do anything, right? So else, if I didn't fail to get a line, recursive case, reverse the file, or whatever, right? So that's if you wanted to have the more standard sort of order that you guys might be used to. Um, well, OK, let's give it a try. Oh, I have, to, I have to uncomment the test case up here. So where is it? Reverse line? Here. And then there. OK, so where is our code? We are here. Yeah, OK, let's do it. So run it. And hey, it prints roses are red, violets are blue, all my base belongs. So it, it worked. But I mean, it's kind of unsatisfying, right? Because we totally cheated, right? So again, since I wasn't sure if you guys could handle this problem, I wrote this already. So let me just reveal how I wrote that function. Oh, shit. I just call your function. The power was within us all along. Um, so, I mean, this isn't cheat law, this is reverse lines, right? Like, how is reversing a file similar to reversing a file? Well, if I had a magical function that could reverse the rest of the file, and then I called it, then after it's done, I could print the first line of the file at the end, and then I would be done with all of the work. The magical function is our function, the recursive function that we are writing. Um, and I mean, you know, you maybe saw my dumb joke coming, but like, that's kind of the thought process. You sort of say, well, if only I had a magical function that could solve this problem for me, but whoever wrote the magical function insisted that I do a little bit of the work, and then they would do the rest for me, you know? Like, what's the little bit that I could do, and, and then pass the rest off to this magical, smarter function? Well, that's often just the way that you want to call your own recursive uh, function there. So anyway, there you go. Now, the fact that we don't do anything in this case, it's sort of bad style to have an empty if. I guess with these comments, it helps for readability. But I think I would rather rephrase it this way. I'd rather say, if getLine is successful, then we have a recursive case. 
And then here I would sort of go L space case no lines do nothing. Like I'd rather I'd rather not have an empty if because it just kind of looks bad. But I want you to understand that like a base case of recursion could be implicit. This code doesn't explicitly have a block for it. Yeah. When we're writing our own like recursive functions for like homework, do you want us to comment L space case no lines if that is the case? I like <laughs> comments like these. I mean header comments of course to describe what the function does. But I like when students describe to me, like, well, what are these different cases? Why am I in here? What does this mean? You know, I need to reverse the whole file, print the rest of the file, then print my line. I like these sorts of comments. I think okay. it's a good stretch. OK. Questions about that one? Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, what, what is the difference between that, that line holding uh, versus the uh, EOF? Oh, get line boolean versus calling EOF on the file. Well, EOF is after you're done reading. So, I mean, I guess I could say dot EOF here on the stream. That would be fine. Um, I mean, if EOF, stream, uh, input dot EOF. Right, so EOF will be true, uh, input dot EOF will be true if the last time you tried to do a read, it, it failed, if you're at the end of the file. So, um, I, I mean, you can write this code using EOF as well. But either way, you're eventually going to need to get a line or try to get a line. So I thought this was the most concise way to, to phrase that statement. So anyway, I mostly avoid the EOF call because I think the better looping over a file is to just call get line until it fails. I've seen a lot of code with subtle bugs that call EOF. Because the thing is, if you call one read, it won't say EOF until after you've done a line read that failed. So you can get kind of off by one because of that. Anyway, one thing I want to point out about this is that Recursion is actually a pretty good way for, uh, for reversing things because remember we learned about the data structure called a stack, the collection last week, a stack, and we learned that you could sort of empty a stack into another thing and it would reverse it. The call stack of recursive functions is kind of that same way that as these calls come back, that's like an unwinding of a stack data structure. There's not, it's not a coincidence that they have that same name. Uh, if you're... Um, Trying to picture the, the different function invocations, here's a little diagram. So I know you can't really read it down there, but that's the input file. We're looking at the start of the file. We say, okay, first call starts. Let's do if get line. So it reads the roses are red line, and then it makes a recursive call. So down the input file, it advances to the second line, and then we make a second call. So that reads the second line, violets are blue, which advances the file reader, and then we make a third call. Now we read all my base, which is the third line. We advance and we're gonna make a fourth call. Now we read R belong to you. That reads the fourth line. Now we hit the EOF. Now EOF would return true if we called it again. We make a fifth call. The fifth call is not successfully able to read a line, so the if statement doesn't enter. So the fifth call exits right away. It goes back to the fourth call. The fourth call says, I'm done with my recursive call, so now I will print my line. So the line R belong to you appears on the console. Now the fourth call returns. It returns to here. He was waiting for that. So now he prints his line, which is on my base. So now he returns to here. He prints his line, which is violets or blue. I don't know why it's flickering. It's Linux or something. But anyway, <laughs> now he gets back to here. He prints uh, roses or red. So you have to think about these like little rectangle stack uh, things kind of stacking up as you make these function calls. Okay. And it's important to remember, like each of those calls, you know, as they all stack up. Each one has its own copy of these local variables and stuff, right? Uh, one subtle thing, but maybe you guys kind of just take it for granted, is you know usually when you make a recursive call, you pass the recursive call different parameters. You pass n minus one. You pass n over two. Print binary, whatever, right? Usually the parameters that you're passing are sort of shrinking. In this example, we're passing the same file as a parameter. Parameter is the same, right? But of course, it's also shrinking because the amount of the data left to read is shrinking. So when you're passing something by reference, all of the calls are sharing that same value as opposed to each call having its own copy of that value. So if this call reads a line, then the other calls will also have that many fewer lines left for them to read. So that's the sort of modification to the parameters in this case, right? OK, so that's reverse lines. Um, let's do another one. Oh, upside down face, whatever. Um, Let's write one called crawl that you give a, a, a file name or directory name or whatever, and you print the contents of it with indentation. So if it's just a file, I say crawl, you know, lecture slides dot ppt. It just print the name of that file out. 
But if it's a directory, it'll print the name of the directory and then it'll print all of the files in the directory. Of course, a directory could have directories inside of it, which could have directories inside of them, which could have directories inside of them. So there's kind of a nesting self-similar structure to this, right? <laughs> um, and so I want the layers of it to be indented like this, where each subdirectory uh, indents by four more spaces. I think that indenting part is kind of hard. So I want to do that last, let's write one with no indentation. Um, so, okay, now to do this, you might say, well, I don't know anything about how to do directories in C++, but I thought ahead. So I wrote you a slide uh, with some methods we could call, if you import this file lib, you can, um, you can ask if something is a directory or a file. You can list the contents of the directory. There, there's a bunch of different methods here that I think would be, would be useful, right? Okay, so just from a conceptual standpoint, what do you think might be a base case for this uh, function? What's easy to, to crawl? A file. A regular file, is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, okay, so a regular file. Okay, let's go, let's go play, let's go try. So I've got crawl here. So I already included that file library up above. So if it is a regular file, oh no, maybe I didn't include the file library. Nope, I didn't, okay. So let's do file lib dot h <coughs> crawl okay if it's a file then just print it see out and file name and it'll find whatever done okay else so actually that's your base case normal file and then I guess recursive case it's a directory well if it's a directory I'm supposed to print all the contents of the directory um, if you want to get the contents out of a directory using our library, there's a, 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 a function here called list directory. You pass the name, file name or directory name, and then a vector. I think it either returns a vector or it can fill an existing vector by reference, I think. So like if I say vector string files equals uh, list directory file name, I think that works. Is that, is that true? Um, yeah, okay, so list directory. Now, uh, usually when I do recursion, I say, oh, you can't use any loops, you can't use any data structures and all this stuff. For this problem, I allow you to use loops and structures if you like. Um, now you might say, oh, uh, you didn't let me use a loop on factorial, you big meanie, or whatever, fine. But what I would say is I want you to use recursion on the parts of this problem that are self-similar. And I want you to use loops that are the parts of the problem that are more iterative. So how do you know something self-similar? Well, maybe we'll figure it out as we go along. But loops are okay, collections are okay. So I mean, I basically want to print each one of these files, right? So okay, for each string file in files, see out file handle, maybe. Uh, let's see if it works. Oh, I think I have it testing the reverse line. Hang on, let me go up and uh, if only there were like an app that I could automate the testing of code that I've written and just see the results with green or red uh, results in the back. I don't know, something like that. Um, so uh, what does it print? It prints some file names, lib, source, res. Let me show you kind of what directory that we're operating in here. Uh, I've got a directory called lecture eight and there are the files. Wow, it looks like it's totally working, right? I mean, the order isn't exactly the same. I don't know what ordering it uses, but who cares? Um, the one thing that it isn't doing, though, is it's not going inside of these different directories and printing what's in them, right? So uh, how might I address that issue? Suggestions. <coughs> one thing that I want to point out about our recursive crawling function is it doesn't have any recursion in it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we need some of that. Uh, any suggestions? Yes. So where do you, uh, you crawl where? In the for loop. In the for loop. Okay. Yeah. So actually, instead of just printing it, let's crawl it. Because if the thing, if the file in here is uh, a simple file, then it'll just print it anyway, which will be the same as this. But if it's a directory, it'll sort of recursion it up and go inside of it and stuff. Hey, step by step. I heard that. <laughs> Keep trying. Uh, so crawl that file. Let's try that. Oops, it crashed. What happened? So <laughs> what went wrong here? It says error 
list directory can't open dot pro. Uh, wait, what's going on? It's it ended up on the else branch when it had just a file. Yeah, um, let me think. What am I doing wrong here? Oh, so one, one thing um, that, uh, let me think for a second. I think one thing, I always do this, I've done this example before, and I always make the same mistake, which is that um, I always forget whether the file names have the um, directory attached to them or if it's just the name of the file only, you know? Is it foo.txt or is it slash whatever, slash whatever, slash foo.txt? It's a difference. And so I think what I want is, um, I want like the, the, the um, uh, I want to separate those two things out. So like, what did it print before it crashed? Nothing? Yeah, I think what I want is, um, I, it, watch this. So if I, if I comment this out for a second and I just print, see out uh, files is files handle, then I think what I'm seeing here is that the subfiles don't have the folder attached to them, you know what I mean? And so I think it crashed because it can't find those files because like I need to attach the directory name plus a slash in front, kind of, you know? So I think I need to do, um, I think I need to do, file name plus slash plus file. Do you know what I mean? Like within my directory, go into that sub file. So then I think it should work. Uh, <laughs> so now it's looking pretty good, except I kind of didn't want to print all these like um, <laughs> headings in front of everything, but we can come back to that. So there's a couple things wrong. One is that it's printing these like full paths, which maybe I don't, I, I need the full paths to like find stuff, but I don't necessarily want to print the full paths, right? Um, and the other thing is I don't have that indentation yet. So I think the fast way to fix the, uh, the printing the full file versus just the file name is that there's a function called um, get head, get tail, and the head is the directory and the tail is the file name. Um, so I think if I just say print the get tail of the file name, then I think it'll print the, there. So it is now printing a lot more output. It's going into all those different directories, um, but I'm not doing the indentation. So that's what I want to do next. Yeah. It's still not printing the, file, the name of the <coughs> directory. So we still need to see out the name of the directory before the calling crawl on it, right? Ah, okay, good, good. So actually, if you look at this um, expected output, if you're printing a directory, you're still supposed to print its name, but then its contents follow that. And you're right that in our code, we print only the contents and not the actual directory name. So I think we always want to print this no matter what, whether it's a directory or a normal file. So like I think you could sort of move this up here and now the base case is empty but the recursive case is this. Maybe we fix that in a second but I think that looks more like it. We have a lib folder with this inside, with this inside. Yeah, okay, so that looks a little better. Now we need indentation because you can't really tell what's inside of what. How do I do the indentation? Well, this is actually the, the trickiest part of this problem, which is why I wanted to look at it, which is, um, you know, you might say, well, okay, before I crawl the, the sub files, I should print some indentation, right? So uh, let's go here and go see out space, 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 or something like that, and then we'll crawl the rest. Let's try it out. Hmm, that looks pretty good, okay. Oh, but it's not, I want like more indentation the more deep that I am in the structure here, kind of, you know what I mean? Um, so let's talk about this output for a second. Let's go to text editor. Uh, so really, I have these files and then I have lib and inside of lib has this and inside of Stanford lib has that and inside of collections I have that and you know so there's a nesting here that I'm missing in my output and I think the problem is like picture the recursion for a second I'm like here so I go okay print a couple of spaces or print a tab or whatever but now the next the recursive call is going to print a bunch of lines you know what I mean and so it's not just that I want to print one indentation out it's that I want all of these lines to be preceded by an indentation. You understand? So just printing indentation once here and then doing this recursion here isn't going to quite cut it. So I somehow need to pass along information to the next call. And I need to tell it, you need to print your lines with this indentation in front of them. You need to print all of those lines with this indentation in front of them. 
Do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, you could have a second parameter. That's the number of spaces to print before any file. Have the default to zero, but every time you like recurse in a different directory, you add four to it. Yeah, I think that's the right idea here. Is sometimes to solve a recursive problem, you have to change the game a little bit. Um, the function I asked you to write was to write this crawl that takes a file name. But if we added another parameter called uh, string indentation, then what you could do is you could pass along how much indentation to print in front of each line as a parameter. Of course, I told you to write a function that only takes this parameter. So if you want to make your needed parameter compatible with mine, I think what you said was just pass a default value of no indentation. But then if you make a recursive call, you pass what, four spaces is the indentation? Or what do you pass here? Indentation plus four spaces. Yeah, my indentation plus four more spaces. You understand? Because that will make it so that the next one will be four plus four, eight, eight plus four, 12. I want it to increase as I go along. There's one more fix I need to make here. I'm never using the indentation in the output, right? I'm passing it along, but I need to include it when I'm outputting stuff. And so that means before I do C out of my file name, I see out the indentation and then the get tail of the file. Do you see that? So now, oops, uh, get rid of this. Yeah, I don't want that. And then what's this other undefined reference? Oh, so actually in my heading up there uh, at the top of the, the prototype, I, I need to say string indentation equals whatever. And then here I need to get rid of the default. Yeah, okay, so let's try now. Hey, look at that, I think it's working. There we go, see, indentation. Graphics has these, IO has those, private has those, and so forth. Okay, so now I'm printing with indentation. Um, by the way, one thing I haven't talked about very much is when I pass strings as parameters, sometimes I pass them as a constant string reference. You can almost always interchange string to const string reference. It's the tiniest little optimization that saves you from copying a few strings here and there. So uh, sometimes when I, when I have headings, I'll say const string reference, but basically that just means pass a string. Um, yeah, any other questions about crawl? Yeah. So, uh, is it just in general, if, if, you, if you ever have a, have a string like a parameter in a method, is it okay just to always pass by reference? I think in general you should always try to pass by const string reference. The only time I ever don't do that is if I'm going to mutate this in here, I'm going to change it. Then the fact that it's const means I can't change it, so I'd have to make a second copy of it and then change it. And then I'm, if I'm copying it already, I might as well not pass it by const reference. But for many cases, this is just the right way to, to do things. Um, yes, question. Would it be more efficient to pass indentation as an int, um, telling the number of times you should output the tab? Yeah, sure. I could pass indentation as like four spaces and then indent plus four, I could pass eight spaces. I guess the reason I like this is because, um, I mean, th it, they're both fine, but like this way is easier than writing a for loop to print spaces, I think. And C++ doesn't have, maybe it does, but I don't think it has an easy way to say, give me this many copies of this character as a string. You have to like loop, and I just didn't want to write another loop to print the spaces out. This was kind of less code for me. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be better to use the is directory function and then just have one if block instead of an if blank else? Yeah. So I think I would change this to say if is directory, then it's a recursive case, and then I would down here say like else base case normal file do nothing else or whatever. You know? Yeah. That's a better version of the same code. Thanks. Okay. I'm just kind of like rapid firing through a lot of these because I just want to practice a lot. Um, let's look at another one. Let's look at another one. Where are we? Okay. Uh, we talked about optional parameter. We already did that. Crawl. Okay. Do I want to do this one? Uh, if I have time, I want to come back to this one. But hold on a second. I want to come back. I want to do Fibonacci real quick. So uh, <clears throat> the Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of integers where each one is the sum of the prior two. The first two are defined to be one. So fib numbers one uh, and two have value one. Fib three is one plus one. Fib four is two plus one. Fib five is two plus one. So it's the sum of the previous two, right? And uh, you know, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time talking about the Fibonacci sequence and Fibonacci numbers, but they appear all over the place in math and biology and economics and all kinds of crazy stuff. They're very common uh, numbers that you discover in natural patterns and stuff. They're all over the place. It's related to this like golden ratio. If you draw like a spiral of rectangles of Fibonacci sizes, you get this cool pattern, which you know describes the size and shape of many everyday objects that you might encounter. Uh, anyway, enough about that. So um, 
<laughs> so how do you write a Fibonacci function? Well, it probably seems really easy to write recursively, right? So let me go to my project and just write it. So here's int fib return zero. So, I mean, look, like I said, the first two are one. So if it's the first or the second, I guess if it's less than or equal to the second Fibonacci number, return one. Else, it's the sum of the previous two. So this isn't hard. I'm just writing it for us. Return fib of n minus one plus fib of n minus two, right? Cool. So does it work? Well, uh, let's find out. See out fib of, you know, what, seven, endl. So let's do that. Oops, wait, actually, I think this isn't going to run because I have to change this to say main, and then I have to change this to not say main. What a language, C++. Go away. OK. Um, so now I run this, and what's fib seven? It says 13. Is that right? Uh, fib seven is 13. OK, so it's, it's basically working. The point of this one is not that the code, not the algorithm itself. I want to talk about you know, something you guys seemed a little bit concerned about last lecture, which was you know, all this overhead making all these recursive calls, right? So this is an example where the function makes multiple recursive calls. See that? It makes Each call that you make makes two other recursive calls. So how many calls are there? Well, uh, if you compute fib of six, that computes, it, it, sorry for the ugly picture, but like it needs to compute fib of five and fib of four. So fib of Four needs to compute fib of four and fib of three, and fib of three needs to compute fib of two and fib of whatever. So they all have to compute the previous ones. In fact, I might have even messed up the diagram. There's so many calls, but whatever. Like, it's kind of like a tree of calls that splits in two each time, right? And so, okay, like maybe that's not the end of the world. I don't know. It's not that many calls for a fib of six. It might be a lot if it was fib of fifty or something, right? But What's especially uh, concerning is that some of the calls are the same as other calls, right? Like here, as part of this computation, I have to ask for fib of four. So I do all this work, and I eventually know the answer to that. But then I call again fib of four up here, and so I recompute all of those calls to make fib of four. And you guys don't like all these extra function overheads and stuff. I know you asked me about it on Monday. So this is unfortunate that it wastes all this computation, right? Now, I will say, even though it has to make all this number of calls, uh, it isn't like that slow, really, for, for sort of practical size integers that you might want uh, for small ints. Like, I actually, I called my fib that we just wrote 100,000 times, and it took four seconds. So like, I have to run it a lot to measure a slow time, but OK, that's the time it took. Um, so how do we fix this? Well, I mean, of course, the key observation here is that we already computed this. And so therefore, we kind of don't need to ever compute that again. If only we could somehow remember that we computed that, right? So there is this clever trick that's called memoization, which the first time I heard that word, I thought it was like somebody who had a speech impediment, like the, the priest in uh, Princess Bride, like, mowage, <laughs> memoization is why, what brings us together today, you know? <laughs> but that's actually the word, memoization, it's not a typo. Uh, this is basically just where you cache a result of a previous function call computation for speed, so you can reuse it, okay? Um, so here's kind of a very rough pseudocode of how do you do a uh, memoization. You make some sort of cache or some data structure, a vector, a map, something that can store results in it, bless you. And then your function that you're writing, you say, well, have I ever computed f with these args before? If I have, look it up in my cache and return the answer. Otherwise, actually compute it, put it in the cache for later, and return it. Pretty simple, right? Um, so if you wanted to do that with fib, there's different structures you could use. Um, I think since we're computing Fibonacci numbers, you need to sort of be able to say, have I ever computed this in Fibonacci number before? There's lots of different collections you could use. I like to show that with maps, although you could use an array or a vector because we're operating the domain of, of natural numbers and integers here. But I kind of like saying, uh, let's use map.h, or maybe hash map would be fine. Let's do hash map, hash map. So then I'll say hash map of int comma int cache. So you sort of make a, a map somehow. Now in here, you say, well, the first two are easy. I don't need to cache those. Those are fine. Then here, my result is that. And I want to remember that result so that I never have to compute it ever again. So I'll say cache.put 
result, or I guess uh, the, the key is n, right? I want to look up someday, do you have a result in there for n? Yes, here it is, right? And then I say return result. Now the only thing we're missing is that we, we're storing stuff in the cache, but we aren't using anything out of the cache. So you sort of insert it here before you do any kind of recursion stuff. You say else if my cache dot contains n, then return cache dot get n or cache bracket n, right? That's basically it. The only thing I don't like about this solution is that I have this, this thing here, there's a global variable. <laughs> You know, we're supposed to hate global variables. They're bad, they're evil, don't use them. Um, there is a cute little hack in C++ and C um, where you can declare a variable that's global to a function um, and it's called a static variable. So if you move this in here and you say static hash map cache, it's a weird piece of syntax, but basically what this does is it doesn't create a new map every time you call this function. It creates one once the first time you ever called a function. And now it's visible only to that function. So it's sometimes called function private data. Java doesn't have this. But uh, anyway, if you put the map here, it will not be global anymore, but it will stick around after the function is done. The next time you call the function, it'll still be here. It'll still be the same map, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah? Is that, will it be global to the function or to whatever? Oh, if you put it in an if statement, it will be global to that. Oh, can you put a, can you put a static? I don't know how, actually, to be really honest with you, I don't remember whether you could put static stuff in like an if and then it lives in that if or whatever, right? I've only ever seen it at the start of a function. Um, if you put it outside of a function, it's still a global variable, but now it's global only to that file and other files that try to talk to that variable can't see it, but it's still a global variable, so don't do it. But um, so, I mean, frankly, I don't know all the ins and outs of the syntax. I'd be happy to Google it later for you if you want, but I don't know. Uh, I know that you can put it here and it works. Um, so, just for reference, uh, we did 100,000 runs of the method and it took uh, about four seconds. So, I'll run it again with the same number of runs, but now we have our memoization. And now it takes 13 milliseconds. So, it does a lot less computing. That tree of calls doesn't split up in that same way uh, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, sorry, say it again. Like the first time you run it, will it like cache its own result? And then like every time in the future, it just instantly returns that result? Yeah, I guess if, if you want to really trace the recursion here, uh, and actually this will probably be, well, I think I can do one more thing after this, but if you want to trace through the result of this, this is going to cache the results of fibs uh, three through, if you call fib of seven, this will cache fib three through seven because the fib call of seven gets here to, to six and five and four and three. When you get down to three, we're going to put three result, four result. All of those calls are going to do that. In fact, after, I mean, I could just do C out cache endl if you like. And <laughs> it caches three and then four and then five and then six and then seven. And I guess it's doing some other fib numbers later. But yeah, it's. It's building them in that way because the calls, you know, the stack amongst each other in that order. Uh, question, yeah. Uh, was the original Fibonacci function without the caching uh, of two to the n? Uh, it does have an exponential runtime, yeah, um, because each call makes two more calls, and so it's roughly on the order of, of two to the n number of total calls, yeah, which is bad. <laughs> exponential <laughs> runtime is bad. Just look at that chart I gave you, and it's like the size of the known universe. You have to wait for for large uh, values, yeah. most of the speed up we're seeing right is not from the actual fact that within one call to fib, to fib we're doing a lot less computation. Like that speeds up the first time we call fib. Because if we're calling it 10,000 times, the other 9999 calls are just a dictionary. Like, can we do a single call? Yeah, you're, you're right that like, number? so the problem is if I call it once, I can't capture the time of that. So what I could do is I could say like, you know, int r equals uh, random integer from one to 40 or something, and I could be trying different fib values or something like that. Same, same it's argument. still pretty fast. No, but there's two kinds of speed up here, and I think it's important to notice both of them. They're both interesting. One kind of speed up is if I ever call fib of n again separately later, I will not have to compute it again, or, or anything up to n as well, right? <coughs> that, that's cool. 
Another thing is within the single computation of FibN, I don't have to have those second splits of that tree. So it speeds up both of those two things, and those are both valuable uh, uh, things to do. So actually, you can use caching and memoization even if you're not in a recursion context. You might have a really expensive function that crawls your files searching for a result and captures that somehow, and that might not even be recursive necessarily, but you save it in case you need it again. So memoization is outside of recursion as well. Yeah. What's the runtime of this? Yeah. Uh, well, if you're in the cache, I mean, the average case is hard to, it's hard to talk about the runtime a little bit, I would say. But um, I believe that if you're not in cache, you have an n number of calls, right? And if you're in cache, you have a constant time. So anyway. Uh, OK, I think I need to stop just because we're out of time. But hey, go to section, practice more recursion. We'll do more of this on Friday. We'll learn about fractals, which are really fun. I'll see you then.